Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this webinar. Um, we're going to be talking about setting financial targets for water utilities beyond the budget. And um, we are very happy to have uh, speakers from two utilities with us. Uh, this is Shadi Eskaf with the Environmental Finance Center uh, at the UNC School of Government. And we'll do introductions in just a minute. Uh, but before we get started, I want to make sure that everybody is able to hear me. So I have this slide up here. Um, hopefully people who can't hear will see the notes up there. It says, if you can't read it, please do this for audio. Uh, but just quick housekeeping issues. Everybody's muted on this call. Um, and if during the presentation you find that the control panel kind of disappears, you can always click on that red arrow at the top uh, so uh, to open the, the control panel and be able to toggle between full screen and, and uh, window screen view. Uh, please follow the instructions to uh, connect through audio. Uh, and we always recommend phone call. It's usually a clear um, connection, but speakers will also work fine. Uh, if you have any questions at any point, please submit your questions in the questions box. Now, if the control panel is hidden, you're going to have to show the control panel first uh, and then open up the questions box. You might have to click on the, on the button on the top left corner of the question box uh, to, to reveal the question and then type in your question here. Please enter in the question at any point during this webinar. Uh, Carol Rosenfeld, my colleague, uh, is sitting here monitoring the questions box and she's going to be um, logging them and we'll have time at the end to answer as many questions as we could. Uh, but please feel free to submit questions as you um, as you think of them instead of having to wait till later. Uh, most commonly asked questions are, you know, is the PowerPoint presentation going to be available? Uh, yes, the PowerPoint slides and also the recording of this webinar will be posted uh, on the web page where you register for this uh, webinar. We will be sending an email to all to all of you. Uh, with a uh, direct link to the recording and to the PowerPoint slides. You could also download the slides today. Um, if you look in the control panel, there should be a section that's called handouts. Uh, you'll find three handouts listed there. Uh, the second handout are the PowerPoint slides, so you can just download them um, uh, right now. Uh, you can also download a copy of the 2017-2018 Utility Management Survey that we completed and uh, Carol had done a webinar uh, just a few weeks ago talking about some of the results of that of the survey. Uh, so that's available again through the handouts. And also we have uh, a third handout which is talking about uh, there's a chapter that was written for a Water Research Foundation report um, on resilience, um, resilient business models for water utilities. And there's a whole chapter about financial strategies. In that chapter is a section about setting financial targets and um, measuring performance against those targets uh, with some more examples. So I'm providing with a copy of that chapter. It's okay for us to do that because we were the authors of that chapter, uh, so we can share that. Um, but it's also available for free um, on the Water Research Foundation website. It's a publicly available document. All right, so uh, let's move into introduction. Uh, again, uh, we're with the Environmental Finance Center at the School of Government. Uh, since this webinar is focused on North Carolina utilities, I'm hoping that everybody's heard of the School of Government and the EFC by now, but if you haven't, um, welcome, and we look forward to working with you. We are uh, within the UNC School of Government, um, and the Environmental Finance Center focuses on helping um, governments and other organizations providing environmental programs such as water and wastewater uh, in fair, effective, and financially sustainable ways. So we do a lot of trainings, we do a lot of direct advising, um, the webinars that we we present are uh, and the trainings as well are typically broad based or um, they take a, a big picture point of view. Uh, a lot of times utilities would come to us and walk, work with us one on one uh, on more specific issues that might be uh, uh, pertinent only to your utility. So if you see something in here that you think um, this might be something that, that's worth diving into a little bit deeper for your utility, please feel free to reach out to me or any of my colleagues at DFC, and we'll be able to talk a little more specifically about your utility's uh, financial performance and targets. Uh, my contact information is now displayed. Uh, this is Shadi Eska from the Senior Project Director. I've been at DFC since 2004. I'm very, very pleased to have with us two speakers from utilities that have uh, implemented 
financial performance targets and have been using them to great success of, of, on the financial sustainability side for utilities. And these are two utilities that are not the large utilities. This is not Charlotte, this is not Raleigh. We're looking at smaller to medium-sized utilities that have implemented some of these uh, financial targets. Um, as a way, you know, I chose those utilities to, uh, to demonstrate that uh, even smaller utilities can set um, set financial targets and can use them to uh, to some success. So I'm going to uh, uh, ask Maria Honeycutt, who's the general manager for Broad River Water Authority uh, out in Spindale, to introduce herself real quick. Yes. So um, thank you, Shadi. So I'm Maria, and I I'm the general manager and finance officer for Broad River Water. If you don't really know where that is, that's Rutherford County. We're halfway between Charlotte and Asheville. And um, I've been here since 2006. I came to Broad River out of the private engineering um, sector and um, have, have been here for 12 years. Thank you, Maria. So, and Maria is also, uh, sorry, go, go ahead. Shoddy. I was going to say, Shadi had mentioned, um, I also serve on the State Water Infrastructure Authority, the SWIA Board um, Authority, and have been there um, since its inception. Thank you. Yeah, that was that was going to be my add-on. Appreciate that. Uh, we also have with us uh, Stephen Winters, who's a CPA and the Director of Finance and Customer Service uh, at OWASA, which is the Orange Water and Sewer Authority um, in Carborough and Chapel Hill, uh, North Carolina. Stephen, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, Shadi. Yes, thanks. So I've been here roughly nine years and it came from outside the industry completely. I was uh, in public accounting and then actually worked for the AICPA prior to working, uh, coming to work here. And um, oh, you mentioned that we're in Chapel Hill and, and Carborough, a community of about 80, 80 or so thousand people. All right. Thank you, Stephen. All right, so before we get started, we have a question to find out who is in the poll. We introduce ourselves. We'd like you to introduce yourself. Um, let us know. Uh, you should see a poll uh, pop up right now. Uh, please just answer. Let us know if you are working for a local government utility. These include special districts or authorities or metropolitan districts. Um, if you're working for a non-governmental water utility, like um, a for-profit system or a water association, a non-profit, um, water uh, system. If you work for the state government, uh, I know that we have people from the treasurer's office and um, potentially from DEQ. Uh, if you're a technical assistance provider or a consultant uh, or if you're an academic, if you're a researcher who does advising uh, on these type of topics, please select the technical advisor um, option. And if there's something else, just please say that. Okay, looks like we have a good response. Thank you, Carol. Um, so most of you are from local government utilities. That's great. Um, some of you are from non-governmental non systems, which is, uh, which is also great. I think the discussion that I'm going to provide um, or the, the topic that we're, we're talking about here is geared more towards local governments, but a lot of these um, uh, practices can definitely be applied to nonprofits as well. So there's nothing that will preclude uh, nonprofits from doing something similar to this. Uh, it just might be the way that you monitor your finances might be a little bit differently than how local governments do it. Uh, we also appreciate the technical assistance providers, consultants, and state government officials. Uh, feel free at any point uh, to um, submit comments that you'd like for us to read out or to let other people know on this webinar. So if there's something that I'm saying um, that you want to add on something to it, uh, feel free to add that in the questions box, even though it's not a question. Carol will make a note of it, and uh, we'll make sure that we air that as well. Uh, so we thank you all for participating today. All right, so we're talking about financial performance and setting financial targets. Um, usually when we talk about financial performance, uh, most systems will, will automatically think about this, the budget. Uh, you're monitoring um, you have you have your goals about how much revenues you're expecting or you're anticipating or you're aiming for um, and what your expenses and expenditures are going to be. And you monitor that month after month um, and you try to uh, match the actual performance or the actuals versus what was um, adopted in, in the budget. 
and then you, you'll calculate the differences between how much you budgeted versus how much you actually achieved. Uh, that's great and absolutely something that every utility should be doing every month. In fact, from our survey, it looked like um, the vast majority, nearly every system uh, that completed our survey said that they, they monitor the budget monthly. Uh, uh, so we know that that is a common practice. That's not what we're going to be talking about today. The other way to look at financial performance uh, is often to look at the annual financial statements, um, the, audit, the audit statements at the end, and do some um, look at some of the key financial uh, benchmarks and ratios, like operating ratio or debt service coverage ratio, or different kinds of ratios they can compute from these year-end statements. And uh, we certainly do a lot of that for the utilities. It's on our rate dashboards. Uh, it's something that the state treasurer does. It's something that you all, we know that a lot of systems also do that, uh, looking at the audit financial statements. Again, that's, a, that's a, a fantastic practice and it should continue. But now we're going to be talking about something that's a little bit more, um, a little bit more proactive and a little bit different than all of this. So we're going to be talking specifically about setting financial policies and targets. And financial policies are, uh, broadly speaking, uh, they're, they're bigger than what we're talking about in this webinar. Financial policies are uh, guidelines and um, uh, statements about what your organization will or will not do, what's an acceptable or unacceptable unaccept uh, course of action. Um, it establishes parameters in which your organization will operate. So uh, you could set uh, a guideline that says that um, if something of this nature happens, then we will act in this way, or we are aiming for uh, a financial performance and target of uh, a specific kind. There are a lot of different kinds of policies that you could set. A lot of them, you know, collection policies or billing uh, policies. Uh, what I'm going to be focused on a little bit more is just a subset of those policies, and that's going to be focused more on uh, establishing uh, proactive goals for the financial stability and health of the system. Usually that means setting a specific financial target and trying to achieve those targets beyond what the budget is. So the budget is sort of doing that. You're setting targets for each line item in the budget. But in this case, we're talking about having specific ratios or specific um, relationships between the revenues and expenses and how you deal with cash, what you do with debt, uh, what kind of risk uh, you, your system is willing to take, what do you do with your reserve accounts, uh, and setting specific targets that you're trying to achieve and reacting uh, as you measure yourself against those targets. GFOA has been recommending local governments to adopt and use uh, financial policies and these types of targets uh, for many years now, and we know that a lot of systems have been doing that, um, including the two who are on the call with us today. Uh, here are some examples of what these kind of financial targets look like. You're not going to find two utilities that have exactly the same financial targets or even the same set of targets. Uh, each utility customizes based on its own needs and also based on um, what the board and what the senior staff uh, think is most important for that system. Um, but typical categories of targets that we see uh, out in the field are targets on reserves, or cash on hand, or anything to do with um, you know, rate stabilization fund, uh, the funds that you have to, um, uh, that, that contain your unrestricted and undesignated funds. What do you do with that? How big do you want that to be? Or how little do you want that to be? Uh, and how do you use the funds that go into, uh, into that? Uh, or how do you use the revenues that go into those funds? Uh, there's also working capital reserves. There are targets for debt. Uh, especially on the debt service coverage ratio, which are set by the bond covenants, but also utilities tend to have um, additional uh, targets that they try to achieve. Um, targets on debt burden, whether that's um, uh, how much debt the system is taking on as a whole, or how much the customers, uh, if you look at the debt and you spread them out on the number of customers, um, what's the debt per customer level, and do you want to set a cap on how much you uh, your customers are in, quote unquote, paying off the debt for the system. Um, there are also targets about the balance between how much cash versus how much debt you take on for capital projects. And we'll see some examples of that later on. Uh, OWASA is one of many utilities that have 
a specific target on affordability as well. Um, and I'll leave Stephen to talk about that um, towards the end. Uh, there are also some utilities that would target, that have a very specific target of, of a credit rating. We, are tar we want to achieve a triple A rating and that is their target. So it doesn't have to be a target that the um, numeric target and something you can measure directly um, or quantify every single year. It could be a target such as uh, we want to achieve triple A rating. Um, and that's, uh, that's still within the realm of what we're talking about here. Okay, so having described some of these categories of targets, we have a new poll. Um, we'd like to know how many utilities here have some of these targets uh, and are using them. Now, you might not have them now, or you might have, have them um, informally. So you, you don't yet have something that is a um, specific target that the board has approved or that is a number that you're always trying to achieve, but you're having it in mind and you're trying to make sure that um, you're achieving, um, you're achieving the goal. So that's an informal target. Some utilities do have formal targets. They've documented it. They've talked to the board about it. They've gotten the board buy-in. The board has approved it um, and have very specific goals and targets. And if you don't know, if it's not applicable to your system, just um, we have an option for that too. Okay, well, I think that we probably can close it now. Thank you. So some of you on, on the call have not set financial targets. Um, so hopefully this webinar will kind of introduce you to uh, some examples um, that you see across the state. Uh, some of you have informal targets, which we are hearing quite a bit about. Uh, a lot of systems might be interested in, in formalizing some of these targets or not but having some kind of a target that the system is using to drive financial decisions um, is helpful, whether it's formal or informal. Uh, for those who are on the call um, and already have formal targets, hopefully you can kind of compare what you have with other systems. But again, I caution you to um, not to just kind of copy what others are doing, uh, really think about your system and customize to your system. But you might find some examples that we'll talk about here that might kind of spur some more ideas for your system, whether to tweak your numbers or to uh, adopt a new target for a different category. So thank you all. I mentioned earlier that we've done a utility management survey um, in 2017 and 2018. And um, we want to thank the North Carolina Policy Collaboratory that, that funded that research. Actually, it's funding this webinar as well. Um, the survey was done by us at the EFC and by the League of Municipalities, and we had about 200, well, we had 227 North Carolina utilities, which represent about 44% of the system, um, participating in that survey. So if you're one of them, thank you all very much for participating. Um, on that survey, we asked a lot of questions about planning practices and management practices, only one section of which was focused on financial performance. Um, and I'll show you a couple of results from that. If you would uh, like to download the survey results, you can go on this link or, again, in the handout um, section of the, go of the webinar platform, you can download the results uh, as the first handout. So from the survey, uh, out of 216 utilities that responded to the question about financial targets, what we found is that 62% uh, of the utilities said that they set some kind of financial target or goal. Not all of them are formal. Um, 30, about 40% said that they have actually formal goals approved by the governing board, but um, quite a few, 22% that said um, they also have informal. 31%, um, which is 31% um, of the utilities said they don't set financial targets and goals. Uh, some, many of those are smaller systems. Um, I think that larger systems tend to think about these um, financial policies and, and adopt them faster than smaller systems do. But as you'll see later on, even very small systems are able to come up with um, uh, good targets and, 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 um, and measure themselves um, against those targets. <clears throat> Another thing that we noticed from the survey is that, uh, like I said, you know, nearly everybody is looking at the budgets monthly. Uh, but more specifically, 57% of the utilities responding said that they monitor recent financial performance against specific targets and benchmarks whether these are formal, informal, or they are uh, targets that they set themselves or not, we didn't specify. We just asked if they measure, uh, if you, you all 
measure your performance against benchmarks and targets, and uh, a majority of systems do, but again, there's, you know, from this, 47, 43% of the systems um, could use some guidance on um, what kind of targets to use. We analyzed um, some statistics about the utilities that have financial targets and are monitoring financial targets versus those that don't have those targets. And we, we were curious to see if utilities that adopted targets uh, early on, in this case we said before 2013, um, did they end up performing better financially uh, at the end, you know, a few years later on? Has there been any kind of evidence that having these targets and measuring yourself against these targets and using these targets actually improves financial performance. Um, and what we found is that even when you compare it against similar size systems or, or same kind of resource level, same number of employees, uh, utilities that did financial did start using financial targets by 2017 by 2013, four years later, had higher operating ratios than utilities that did not have financial targets. And that was statistically significant, which means that the ratio, the revenues to expenses ratio was, was better for systems that had these targets than those that didn't. Um, and this is controlling for system size as well. The other thing we found is that uh, those that did have financial targets were twice as likely to have higher operating ratios and expenses um, in fiscal year 2017. So they're more likely to be in the, in the black as opposed to in the red um, when it comes to their finances. So there is evidence that these financial targets and, and kind of following them has kind of helped or is at least um, helping some utilities achieve uh, better financial metrics. Okay, so another poll question for everybody. Uh, we uh, I mentioned earlier about you know some different types of uh, categories of financial targets. We'd like to see, uh, for those of you that do have, if you don't have them, you can, you can skip this question. For those of you that do have targets, which targets do you um, do you have for your system? And this is a select all that apply um, question. So choose as many as you have. Um, do you have anything about the minimum reserve balance? Do you have specific debt service coverage ratio, whether it's something that's the bond governance that's set for you or if you have your own um, ratio target? Do you have some operating ratio or, or operating margin target that you're looking for or debt burden or anything else? I'll give you just a few more seconds to of respond to that. Okay. Thank you all. So what we see here is that, again, there's diversity in the types of targets that utilities are setting in the state. Um, all five of these categories, including the other categories, 29% uh, of utilities said other. So there's a lot of different things out there right now which makes talking about this really difficult because it, it's, there's such a diversity of options and diversity of practices uh, across the state. But it does seem that you know having a minimum reserve balance and a debt service coverage ratio, those are the two of the most commonly used um, categories when it comes to financial targets. Um, debt burden and um, targets for, for operating ratios are also um, pretty common, including those uh, here on this call. All right, thank you. I mentioned earlier that um, there was a report done for the Water Research Foundation uh, back in 2014. It's called Defining a Resilient Business Model. Uh, and there's a chapter all about strategies uh, and practices for revenue, uh, for revenue resiliency. So if you want to download that chapter, you'll find that in the handout section. I mentioned diversity. Um, and and it, it comes in, in many different ways. You have formal. Um, targets versus informal. I talked a little bit about that. Uh, you can have targets that um, hold the utility um, uh, accountable to specific measures uh, and and you communicate to the board, this is how much we, this is what our target was and this is how we performed versus targets are a little more broad and a little more flexible and gives the utility more um, um, abilities to kind of uh, act um, but not be held accountable to specific um, numeric targets. You also have policy level versus procedural uh, types of um, policies, which hopefully is self-explanatory, and then actionable ones. Uh, so you have uh, policies that say we will do X, Y, and Z if we reach this, this type of targets uh, versus other philosophical ones that just talked about in general we want to achieve 
um, these kind of overall um, goals for the system. The key thing is it needs to be customized for each utility. People ask us sometimes, where do you start if you only have some of these? Uh, one thing is to talk to um, other people to kind of learn from their experience. But um, typically what we've seen is that it, it starts off by the, the, the experience of the staff uh, at the utility. Sometimes it's board driven, um, but more commonly it's the staff that drives it and gets the board buy-in later on. Uh, but it's okay if it's board driven as well, as long as the staff um, gets involved and kind of helps uh, decide what those metrics are. Uh, review credit rating agency statistics and guidance documents because they will um, they provide some uh, stats about how much are you to lease, where is the state of the industry right now when it comes to some of these metrics, and that can help um, utilities decide what kind of targets to be achieving or aiming for, especially if you're trying to aim for a, a double A or triple A rating. And then see what your peers are doing. So again, look at these kind of webinars, look at um, uh, talk to each other on the um, on the listservs and find out what utilities are doing and setting, but again, customize yours. Uh, and most important is to get the governing board buy-in. Um, that means formalizing it, but also if you, you don't necessarily have to formalize it, you could have these informal targets, but at least the board needs to be aware that you're measuring yourself to get these targets and you're trying to achieve these targets, and they have some kind of input into what those targets are. A couple of quick examples, um, and these are from small systems in particular. Uh, so here's from the town of Shalot, North Carolina, which has 2,300 accounts. Um, very small system, but they have a, a, a target for their cash on hand. Uh, and this is a quote from the email that I received, which is, uh, the Board of Aldermen has always used. It's an informal rule. They don't have a, a documented rule, but it's an informal rule of a 90%. Uh, so they want to make sure that their their fund balance, their cash on hand, is always going to be enough to cover at least 90% of the current budget um, so that they have enough funds available to uh, pay for emergencies in particular, uh, but in general, it helps with um, cash flow issues as well. Uh, and they specifically mention that being a coastal community, um, they realize that a hurricane could do significant damage, which we received this email before Hurricane Florence, and everybody's seen what Hurricane Florence um, and what Hurricane Matthews have done uh, in the past. And that's especially true for small systems that don't have a lot of debt um, making capacity. Uh, if you're relying on cash to pay for emergencies, then having a minimum target for cash on hand or for reserves is always critical. Roanoke Rapid Sanitary District has a different type of reserve targets. It's a smaller, it's a small system still, but it's, it's bigger, 7,600 accounts. Um, what they have is uh, they have three different funds that they're managing, an operating fund, the capital fund, and the rate stabilization um, fund. Uh, and they look at a composite. They have a target for each one of these funds, and they just want to make sure that overall accumulation out of all three of these funds achieves the overall target. So uh, they want to make sure that their capital fund, um, it looks like they're, they're spending cash on, on capital projects. They want to make sure that they have enough in their fund, in their capital funds to pay for an average year's worth of capital expenses. They want to make sure that their operating fund has enough uh, in 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 the fund to cover at least a third of the annual um, O and M expenses. And then uh, the rate stabilization fund, they want at least an extra 10% of the annual budget uh, to be put into a uh, rate stabilization fund so that they can weather any you know changes in demand and revenues. Um, so these three um, targets for one particular year would have said that they need to achieve $7.4 million, so to have at least $7.4 million combined in all of these three funds. And they measured themselves against their undesignated fund balance. So they looked at their undesignated fund balance at 8.6. It's higher than their $7.4 million, so they're achieving their targets. But you can do these kind of composite uh, targets as well. With debt service coverage ratios, um, we have, um, you know, bond companies typically set a 1.2 or 1.25, uh, usually 1.2 uh, target, but some utilities are a little more ambitious and they're trying to create a little more um, stability and a little more security um, to be able to pay their funds. And also because the higher the debt service coverage ratio, the more likely that uh, you'll get higher ratings uh, if you go for credit ratings. Um, typically, 
or some of these utilities would aim for a higher, either 1.5 or 2.0 as a debt service coverage ratio. On cash financing of capital capital projects, uh, we've seen examples, a lot of examples that say we will spend no less than a certain proportion, 25% um, of the annual capital expenses uh, through debt, uh, sorry, through cash. So they will say that we, as a utility, have taken on the decision that we're not going to be 100% debt financed for all of our capital projects, and that uh, we need to raise rates now and to be able to, to pay for a portion of our capital project uh, through cash, pay, pay go, or um, other means. And they will set a minimum target of um, looking for the capital projects and, and making sure that at least a portion of those capital projects will be paid out of cash. And having that target allows them to, to determine ahead of time what the rates need to be to be able to achieve uh, the funds that they need in their, whether it's capital funds or um, any other fund that's being used for these projects. Another example that we've seen is a little bit different kind of angle. Um, this one's more of a, I think, the more of a procedural one, what they're going to do with surplus revenue. So, um, you know, lo local governments don't make profits. Uh, so, what Arlington Water Utilities Department, not in North Carolina, but a different utility, uh, what they said is any unbudgeted revenue that's coming in um, that's surplus of their need and surplus of 60 days of their O&M expenses will be used for uh, capital expenditures in that year. So they'll, 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 you know, they'll, any kind of surplus will automatically be used to, to um, invest in the system uh, through their assets. I mentioned earlier that credit rating agencies have specific uh, numbers and targets, uh, or not targets, they, they report on what systems do, uh, and these help systems decide on what these targets are. I'm happy to talk about that offline if you're interested. Uh, we can't share what those numbers are because these are not publicly available documents, but we can, we can help advise uh, systems that are interested in looking at that. I'm gonna skip the measurement section because I think that both um, Maria and Steven will talk a little bit about that. So I just wanna point out that some systems like to have these kind of dashboards, uh, visual ways of sharing with their board uh, what the targets are and how their system is uh, performing against those targets. Uh, so this is from town of Shalot. This one here is from Owasa. Um, I don't know if Stephen will be talking about that specifically, but uh, I'm throwing it out there to kind of show you that in some of their dashboards, they actually have their targets uh, showing up and, and they measure themselves against the targets. So it's an easy way to communicate with the board uh, as opposed to tables. All right, so at this point, I'm going to switch over to Maria Honeycutt, um, ask her to please talk about uh, Broad River Water Authority's financial targets and, and implementation. Okay, thanks. So before we jump into that, one of the important things about this is the story behind the financial model that we adopted. Um, Broad River system was a Duke Power water system and in the late 90s they um, floated the idea to sell it. So three of the towns in our county got together um, to form this authority as a local government utility and they purchased the system, the distribution and the water treatment plant for $30 million. So right off the bat um, in 1999 we started out with $30 million of debt um, but we were we were also a textile and furniture um, community, and so very quickly from '99 to 2004, everything just tanked from sales, revenue, water production. Um, you know, we had a lot of bankrupt uh, industries here, and so when I came on board in 2006, um, of course I wasn't told about that whole story, um, but um, when when I and I was not I was not the experienced staff I had never worked for a utility before and so you know it became very clear that we were the one target that the board was was familiar with was our debt service coverage because of that 30 million dollars in debt and so in that first year that I was there we were very close like within ten thousand dollars of not making that 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 requirement 
um, which was very scary. So luckily, I, um, I had no idea that utility, financial, economist people existed. And luckily, I came across someone who was able to come to my board, which was something that I couldn't say, and, and lay it out in a very clear way to say, this utility has to do something different. And the recommendation at this point is a 10% increase, and the next year is a 5% increase, and maybe we can get down to the 3% and 2% rate increases. Um, the board had not done rate increases on an annual basis, and they were also spending money to extend residential water lines, which didn't really give us the recovery and revenue that we needed or the sales. Um, so, so we had a real neat turnaround um, between a combination of this financial model process and putting ourselves in a position to partner with other utilities to the point that in 2009, we made some agreements where we basically doubled our um, sales in volume overnight with partnerships through different counties, different communities, and now we serve about 52,000 people with drinking water. So that was a pretty cool turnaround, but that didn't happen until, you know, 2009, 2010. So on this model, and it's gone through several iterations because we followed the consultants between about four different companies, but currently we're with Stantec and and so if we work our way from the top down, so the first line shows, so I want to also talk about the difference between the blue and green before we get started. So the blue, um, it talks about the, the rate plan and then the last plan. So in the model, we can change things. We can turn it on, turn it off to see what kind of impact it has. The plan is actually what, what was projected by the budget, which was, um, suggested or or um, in a draft form the last plan would have been either the prior year or you could compare what was proposed versus what was accepted so in the in that rate fee the rate plan the neat part is that we can go through because the board for the last two years has been a little hesitant to um, introduce rate increases only because which we'll talk about, our debt will be retiring in 2026. And we don't really, at this point, have a very long-term plan on what we're gonna do with the quote-unquote excess money at that point that's not going towards principal and interest on our debt. So, um, so for the last two years, they've not done a rate increase and that shows in the blue, but it also, when they change those numbers in the blue and green at that point, all these targets below, so for the revenue fund specifically, you can see how that rate increase or not doing a rate increase changes your revenue fund over time. And so that 3% may only make a difference of $150,000 in one year, but it's really neat to see the impact that it has long-term over the years, that that one time that you didn't do it, what happens as you go. So that was that's one of the first, because that's one of the first thing on our board's mind of year to year is what are we gonna do with rates this time? And we wanna show them what it does long-term. So the next slide is the impact of our bulk customers. And as I mentioned, we have um, two major resale contracts one of those, the rate is by contract, and that's not something that's played with in this model. The other is a long-term contract that we've had since before um, Broad River existed under Duke, and and that model that doesn't that rate doesn't get changed um, on a on a periodic basis. So we get to sort of play with that and see the impact. That third line, the um, debt service coverage. Like I said, this was the target that was always right in front of the board because it was a requirement. It was reported in the audit. They were very familiar with that. So with $30, 000, $30 million worth of debt, um, that was a significant portion of our cash you know, going out the door. So the neat thing to watch, our requirement is 1.2. Our target has been 1.5. And you can see that in the bottom left for the debt service coverage graph. Um, where the coverage required is 1.2 in the orange, and then the coverage target is in the red. And so we have consistently been above the 
we, um, this past year, I think our audit numbers were 1.78, which was amazing. Um, but we also are getting ready to spend quite a bit of cash for CIP funding. So it wasn't a surprising, um, it wasn't a surprising comparison. We, this debt service coverage, as you know, doesn't include capital expenditures, so that didn't play into it. But what it told us was, you know, we do need to build this cash reserve over time because we do have some large expenditures coming. I'll say that we've done a few borrowings since um, the authorities inception, but it was to the point where we really couldn't borrow even a million dollars more. When we changed out our meters, we looked at, is there any benefit to borrowing? And we were so, we were so close on that debt service coverage that we, we just spent it out of cash. So that was also a bit of mind shift, kind of a philosophy shift for the board of, it's okay to pay this, to, to spend this reserve fund down. Um, we are almost at $9 million and we now feel comfortable to spend a $2.5 million on a treatment plant upgrade that's currently ongoing, where 10 years ago, they would have never bought into that philosophy. Um, so the other thing that that debt service line shows, which prompted our efforts actually towards asset management, if you look in 2027, that debt service coverage, you know, goes crazy because our debt retires in 2026. So then we have all this extra, extra money to do something with. So for the first five years that I was here, the conversation was, well, we can reduce rates when we get out that far. And at the time, I didn't really know how to answer that question. And through the work with you know, SWIA and through the master plan document for statewide, statewide master plan for utilities, it really lays out this path to show if we really want to plan long term, one of the recommendations is you know, a full asset management plan to look at what you have, what condition it's in, when it needs to be replaced, how much is it going to cost, and what funding do you need to have to, re to do that, um, whether it's cash or borrowing. And so it really, for me, was a tool on paper to say we have all these assets that are over 100 years old, and we're very lucky from a Duke Power standpoint, they put in the most expensive infrastructure they had. So most of our wire lines are ductile iron. The treatment plant um, is in really great shape, and we spent money to modernize that too. But it doesn't mean that we're just going to have extra cash, and that if we're really looking forward towards being a viable utility, I can I can um, I can flag where that money is going to go. Um, I just can't tell you exactly how much we're going to need and what we're going to spend when. And so the hope is that that plan is going to the asset management plan will lay that out in a very systematic, um, critical way, um, a prioritized way. So that was our other big driver is that debt service coverage. And then the monthly bill. I wanted to mention we put this metric there just to see what the, what the increases would do. But I want to say that we, we purposefully did not set a target there. Um, we we're now a tier two county, but we have been a tier one county with very high unemployment. Um, but, but the board took the approach that it costs what it costs, that the system viability is more important than say that target of maybe, you know, one and a half or whatever of the, the median household income. We just, we didn't even consider a target there. It just, the approach was it is what it is. And we're gonna educate people about the value of water and about what it takes to have this service and the value, the value that that $49 or $50 a month brings to them. So we have done major efforts in education. Um, we also show on this, this dashboard the revenue versus expenses and um, of course it, it fluctuates widely just with our expenditures in capital really. Our, our cash in is very steady. We're not uh, in a in a growth community. We um, tend to lose more and more industrial and commercial users every year. But our bulk contracts have allowed us to be very stable and very um, consistent over the years. The last thing I want to point out, if you look at the CIP funding and that the middle graph at the bottom, 
there's a little bit of red and I spoke with Shadi about that just to say um, we thought it was important to point out we're not going to borrow you know just that small amount of money but it is a indicator that that would be a great time and that we would have the ability to do something bigger later and um, and that's the approach that we've taken so I also say that these are informal targets for us we've not set a formal financial management policy but the board has adopted these as if they are formal. I mean, this is in front of them every time we discuss the model and, um, and, and these are our targets. And we've been able to achieve these and move towards um, improving our system with that idea of viability in the, in the long term. All right, thank you very much, Maria. Um, we're going to switch over to Stephen Winters, but before I do that, just a reminder for everybody, if you have any questions, please submit them as you go along, and these questions can be for me, Maria, or Stephen. Uh, please submit them in the questions box. Uh, Stephen? Thanks, Shadi. So as you've, as you've seen from what Shadi and Maria both covered, there's a lot of different ways to approach this, and so what I'm going to go through rather quickly is just Awas's approach. And the reason that we set these up, you know, kind of the formalized reason is that we wanted to formalize our approach to strategic financial planning. Uh, we also wanted to influence policy decisions, and then, of course, to measure our financial performance. So similar to the story that, that Maria told, we updated these pro the, the current the set of policies in 2009. Before, they were, they were just in a little bit, weren't, weren't quite as involved as they are now. And part of the reason that we did that is that, you know, like, like probably most of you on the phone, we had declining sales revenue and the need for some pretty drastic rate increases. And so we just needed to put some discipline around our financial planning. So we have um, eight financial management targets that we monitor and that we report to our board of directors and to the public. Um, most of them on a quarterly basis, some are more and more applicable to look at on an annual basis. And to back up some of the things that, that Shadi mentioned before, our financial position in 2009 versus it today, it, it is a lot better today. And I'm convinced that these policies have had some influence on that. Shadi, go to the next uh, slide, please. So um, again, I mentioned that we have eight different measurements. The first three all have to do with reserves and we have three different what we call three different reserve funds, but these are not uh, restricted. Um, they're, you know, we don't have a separate bank account, but nevertheless, these are the, the things that we want to have on hand. And we have one for working capital reserve, capital improvements and, and rate revenue stabilization. And there is admittedly some overlap. If you read the description of our working capital reserve, it would talk about, you know, it, uh, to provide funding for periods of lower sales or unexpected expenses. Well, the, the wording of the rate revenue stabilization reserve fund is, is similar, but the purpose of the latter is uh, to try to avoid large rate increases and also to uh, avoid any middle of the year rate increases, which we've never done, but we, you know, we, we would obviously prefer not to do that. When all of these funds are fully funded, we're at about 320 days worth of uh, operating expenses. So we don't actually measure, you know, have a target based on, on days cash on hand, but that is something that we monitor um, and, and it's kind of a sanity check for the, uh, the, the reserves that I just mentioned here. These definitely influence our uh, decision-making. Uh, similar to what Maria said, we go through the budget process annually and set rates annually and uh, you know, uh, the, the making sure that we have these reserve funds on hand influences what we make, decisions we make about rate increases and even future borrowing. Uh, you can go to the next one, Shadi. This, this set is, as you can see, very focused on debt and debt management. We, um, nine years ago, had about $100 million of debt. Uh, today, we're down closer to $60 million. That was you know, that was kind of on purpose. We felt like we were a little overextended. And having these debt type management uh, measurements, again, helps us 
uh, from year to year, working with the board to you know to make sure we don't get out of bounds of where we want to be from a from a financial sustainability and, and health standpoint. It's probably got, it's probably goes without saying, but these work together. Um, the one that we tend to focus on more than than the others is the debt service coverage ratio, and our target there is 2.0. And you know, if you as you can imagine, if you achieve that debt service coverage ratio, the other debt management kind of fall into fall into line. Uh, next, Shadi, last one. And then um, in Shadi's presentation, he mentioned that you know some organizations, and we are one of those that have targets uh, relative to credit ratings. Uh, you can see in that second to the right column what our goals are. And um, this year, we actually were upgraded by Standard & Poor's to AAA. And they cited as two of the primary reasons was our strong debt service coverage ratio and our uh, amount in reserves. And as Shadi mentioned in his presentation, those are often the most common targets that utilities uh, you know, have and monitor. And then the last one I'll mention is the service affordability ratio. And um, the way we, and I think most other people calculate that is that we compare the average annual OWASA water and sewer bill with the, um, with one and, with, with the median household income. And we want our utility bills to be less than one and a half percent of that median household income. It's an impre imprecise measure to be sure. Chapel Hill area has got pretty big income disparity. So we can make our seals pretty, feel pretty good to say that, well, we're beating that, that target. Our, our ratio is 1.35%. But when you analyze how many people are at or, you know, at, at lower uh, ranges of the income spectrum, you know, their, the percentage of their water bill of their annual income can be quite high. So this is something that helps us stay focused on uh, affordability. And it also helps with the decision making, you know, if we're going to choose to invest in a certain product, uh, project, or something like that, um, you know, we always have to balance it against what's that going to do to the affordability of our our uh, services. Last thing I'll say is that um, these policies have done a has have helped provide continuity. You know, our board, like like I'm sure yours, changes members uh, rotate in and out, and so this helps. Um, provide some continuity for that process and and add some discipline to our decisions related to financial matters. Shadi? Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Maria. Um, yeah, that, that's a great point to, to bring up because we do hear from systems saying without financial metrics or financial um, policies, when there is board turn, turnover, um, it's like going back to square one, having to re-educate and kind of work again all of it together. But if you already have these plans and targets, um, then there's a little more continuity. So thank you for bringing that point up. Um, I'll add, I'm not sure that Stephen knew this, but um, back in 2012, when we were uh, doing this kind of research uh, a while ago, we actually interviewed him on camera uh, to talk about the OWASA experience. This is back in 2012, so I think things might have changed since then. But if anybody's interested to kind of listen more about OWASA's uh, process, uh, we have a YouTube video uh, that you could uh, click on and watch. Stephen, thank you for doing that several years ago. Uh, I want to save some time for questions, so I'm not going to go through more examples, but in that chapter from the Water Research Foundation uh, uh, document that I mentioned earlier that you could download from the handout section, we looked at uh, probably a dozen or so utilities across the country and, and the different types of metrics and goals that they set, uh, including some from uh, from North Carolina. This is back in 2012, 2013 numbers, so some things might have changed, like OWASA numbers might have changed in Charlotte and now Charlotte Water. Their numbers might have changed too. But it gives you an idea of the different types of metrics that utilities were looking at and the variety of approaches. So even just looking at debt service coverage ratio, um, some utilities were aiming at close to that 1.2, 1.25 level. Others were looking at the higher levels. OWASA said that, you know, target is two. Um, Broad River is looking at 1.5 as a target. Uh, but you can see the diversity even within the same category across the state, ac across the utilities. And again, it, it, it explains why you need to kind of customize it because it, it each utility's board, each utility's risk management and, and uh, risk aversion 
uh, is very different. Uh, but this will be helpful. Uh, these slides are helpful in showing you some other examples that you can see from across the country. Uh, and for sure, the biggest one that we see are the reserves. How do you handle cash? How do you handle um, reserves? And, and what do you put aside? And what's the minimum level that you need? So when utilities ask me, you know, what's the first one we should be implementing? If they have debt, obviously they need to have a debt service coverage ratio, but reserve targets seem to be an, an important one. Um, when they ask us like, what is the right way of doing it, what's the minimum level that we should be aiming for reserves, the answer is always it depends. I mean, that's, um, there is no hard and fast rule. Uh, with North Carolina, the general funds, the LGC recommends at least uh, one month or 8% um, of the uh, of the budget to be set aside in general fund, but that's you know, for a minimum fund balance, but that's just for the general fund. That's not for the water utility. And I, I don't think one month is enough for a water utility. We see a lot more of a 365 day cash on hand um, target or um, or maybe 180. Uh, but you'll see even here some examples where it's just looking at uh, even large systems, looking at just two months of O&M expenses. Okay, so let's take some questions. Um, and reminder, if, if you don't see the questions box uh, you might need to click on that red arrow to open up the control panel and then hit this uh, top left corner uh, box next to the questions to be able to submit your questions in here. Uh, but Carol, do we have any questions right now? Yeah, so one question that has come in is uh, related to Stephen's presentation. And the question is, what level of debt would you consider being overextended? So um, Stephen, if you want to chime in, I think you mentioned at one point that OASA had, had uh, I think it was $100 million in debt, and you thought that was overextended. And so maybe you could spe specify a little bit more about why you felt that way and, and what level is overextended. Yeah, sure. The level, what level would be overextended? I, I couldn't put a, a dollar amount on that. But if you uh, think back to the four categories, the four measurements related to debt that, I, that we monitor, uh, you know, total debt shouldn't be more, should be less than 50% of total assets. Um, we've got it back up here now. Annual debt service as a percentage of gross revenue. Uh, I would say that anytime we got near or outside any of those ratios, that that would be an indication that we're, uh, you know, overextended. And, uh, you know, the reasons that, that we, we wanted to bring it down are, are obvious. You know, a higher debt service coverage ratio means, I mean, a higher debt service you're trying to achieve a 2.0 debt service coverage ratio, you've got to bring in twice that in net income. So it puts a real um, you know, strain on rate increases and, and that sort of thing. So hopefully that's help, helpful. Thank you, Stephen. And um, I'm curious uh, how these numbers came up, the less than 50%, less than 35%. Where, where did these numbers come from? And um, you know, was it something that the staff ended up deciding or was it something that the board got to decide? Can you talk a little bit more about the, you know, how do you came up with these thresholds? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's kind of like um, a lot of other things that we all do. And, you know, look, we, we uh, looked around at other utilities and got some examples of, of how they approached it and talked to some of those, you know, those folks on the on the phone to get, you know, here's your policy, but what, what works and what doesn't. So we got a lot of advice there. And, uh, you know, there's some uh, benchmarking uh, surveys and, survey, you know, survey results and things like that well, that, that also was influential. And then we had some board members with some expertise as well. So it was kind of a combination of all those things. And ultimately, this is a board-approved policy, so it was, it was their decision. Um, but, you know, it was a, clearly a collaborative effort between the, the board and staff. Okay, thank you. And, and Maria, um, kind of following up on that, you know, how did Broad River end up deciding on um, some of its thresholds? Uh, and also, you know, you said that this was something that happened recently, that you, you've set these targets um, and you've seen, um, you know, success from that. But what would you recommend for other systems that might not already have financial targets? What would be the step one? What, what should they first do? Well, we, we truly depended on the consultant's advice um, because we didn't have that expertise. And so finding that consultant that really 
understood our organization and took the time and approached it. I've said it over the years because the, the, the presentation was made in 2006. He said things to the board that I couldn't say. And his approach was do the right thing. Like it may not be popular, you, I mean, he could call them out on saying it's not about your reappointment or your reelection to your position. This is the right thing for your utility. And this is not something that you can compromise. And, you know, I'm sitting there with my mouth open going, ah, oh, you know, <laughs> like I'm going to lose my job. Um, but he was so convincing and so direct about it that so from hindsight from that, um, you know, being being in management, you're still a leader in your organization. So you have to lead up and lead across through your influence. So the, the message I would give is to encourage boards and to encourage um, the leadership to really drive home this point of system viability is your most important job. I mean, that is what you're called to do and why you're on these, these boards and these you know, panels and authorities. Um, and so we really just took what the consultant said as this is what we need to do. And then over time, when we, we had never been given the opportunity to increase our ratings. And so we, we had been rated by Moody's when we first did the initial debt as an A2. And they gave us the opportunity in 2017 to, to kind of plead our case and, and go for a rating increase. And we, we did, we moved from an A2 to an A1. And so we, that's not on our targets, but what they stated for us is that consistent, um, that consistent rate increase um, methodology, um, a strong kind of stable, what we see now as a stable service um, area of uh, diversity of customers. We're no longer completely dependent on the large industrial users. These long-term resale contracts are much more stable and much more predictable. Um, so we've seen we've seen those results too. Um, it's been it's been pretty amazing. But my first step was find somebody that knows more than you do, and seek out their their advice about that. All right, thank you very much, Maria, and thank you, Stephen, as well for all your input. Uh, we're right at time, so I'm going to um, move on to the last slide and, and to thank everybody. But uh, we have a quick poll question. We uh, we if you know the Environmental Finance Center, we do uh, blog posts. If you we go ahead and launch that, uh, we have a blog post, and we will report on things like this or, or discuss topics like what are what targets should we have for reserves. We actually we've done those blog posts before. If you're not already subscribed to our blog and you're interested in subscribing, so you can uh, read about these things, we publish one blog a week on average. Um, feel free to say yes, and we'll subscribe you. Uh, but if you have any more questions, while well, well, people are responding, because if you have any more questions, uh, please feel free to um, contact either me or my colleagues uh, at the Environmental Finance Center, or you know maybe Stephen and Maria. Uh, I know the email addresses are, are listed, uh, but we're happy to discuss this. We can close the poll. Thank you. Uh, we're we're happy to discuss um, these topics. Uh, in more detail. So thank you everybody for your attention and for participating and thank you to our speakers. Thank you.